Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our Easter season is filled with turnaround tales. On Easter, the greatest turnaround tale of all time was told as Jesus rises from the dead. It doesn't get any better than that. But all the stories that follow speak of turnarounds too. The disciples are at table with Jesus in Emmaus and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Thomas is in the upper room with Jesus and finally when he sees his hands and his side, he recognizes who he is. And now we encounter Saul, later we'll know him as Paul and Peter in their turnaround tales. Saul of Tarsus was a religious leader who had hate in his heart. He especially hated Christians. He felt anyone who was Christian should be put to death. He had stoned Stephen to death or led that stoning. And here in the ninth chapter of Acts, we meet him on the road to Damascus, determined to crush the movement of Jesus' people once and for all. He's going to bring them back to Jerusalem, try them and execute them. But God, has another plan. As a self-proclaimed prosecutor and notorious persecutor of Christians heads to Syria, Saul is leveled by a lightning bolt and the voice of Jesus. No one has ever said it better than this. Flannery O'Connor writes, I reckon the Lord knew the only way to make a Christian out of that one was to knock him off his horse. While lying in the dust, probably face down, he hears the voice of Jesus. Jesus asked, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? The voice replies, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. From the dust of the Damascus road, the temporarily, <clears throat> excuse me, the temporarily blinded Saul rises to become the greatest evangelist of our faith. He turns from darkness to light. And this turn is one of the most dramatic stories of change the world has ever known. The hater of Jesus becomes the lover of Jesus Christ. Through the power of God at work in him, Saul completely turns around. In John's Gospel, the risen Christ is making breakfast on the beach along the shores of the Galilean Sea, and he invites his disciples to join him. Truthfully, it is not every day that someone, having risen from the dead, can make a fire, catch some fish, and cook those fish, and feed you by the seaside. I think you will agree with that. His friends have seen him in resurrection life twice before in John's Gospel, as John tells us both appearances in Jerusalem. Now, here, as the gospel closes, we meet the risen one one last time. Although he's cooking for everyone, Jesus is singularly focused on one person and one person only, Peter. The two of them have some things to work out. Peter has some reconciling work to do with his savior. Remember, it was just a few days before that Peter denied Jesus three times as Jesus was being arrested, beaten, tried, and crucified. Peter told everyone within earshot he had no idea who Jesus was, hadn't a clue. Imagine how that would feel if you were in Jesus' place, being arrested, beaten, falsely accused, and crucified, and denied by your closest friend. So when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He really is digging deep into this question. Three times Peter acknowledges his love for Jesus. Of course you know I love you, of course you know. Every time I, you ask, it's like you're getting me more upset, right? And each time Jesus calls his leading disciple to care for the sheep as a shepherd cares. This fisherman is no longer a fisherman, he is a shepherd now. By the time Jesus is done with these questions, Peter is totally rattled. He should be. Finally, 
Jesus calls Peter even deeper. He says, when you were a child, you went and ran, you played wherever you wanted to go. Now you're an adult and you will be called to a place you would rather not go. And he will be crucified upside down on a cross. It doesn't get any more difficult than a place like that. And Jesus says, come and follow me. Peter turns around on the seaside at Galilee, faced with the challenge of Jesus to love, Peter comes back to life. He rises to become the leader that Jesus has always believed he was. He not only proclaims his faith in Jesus, but demonstrates obedience and a heart to follow him. He turns completely around. Peter and Paul are turnaround tales, which are foundational turnaround tales in the early church and continue throughout time to shape who we are and the faith we have today. In her book, Darkness to Light, the best book ever written, in my mind, on conversion, Dr. Beverly Roberts Gaventa shows how the New Testament is just packed with one turnaround tale after another. She frames these turnaround tales in three kinds of changes, alterations, pendulum-like conversions, or transformations of faith. Now, an alteration would be, well, I go to this church at one point in my life, and I go to that church at another point. That's an alteration. Uh, a, a pendulum swing would be, I go to this church and then I become Hindu, so I'm no longer Christian, I'm a part of another faith. That would be a pendulum swing. But the transformation of faith, which happens most often, is something where you're completely changed. I'd like to dig deeper into her writings because it's worth it, but now's not the time. Rather, the question for us, in light of the transformational turnaround tales of Peter and Paul with Jesus is, why? Why bother asking questions? Simply put, why ask? Jesus stops Paul on the road to Damascus and asks, why do you persecute me? Jesus asks Peter three times at the seaside, do you love me? Why did he bother to ask these questions? Why ask questions at all when you think you know the answer? and all you want to do is make a declaration about something instead. When I was young, my father, who was a journalist and an editor, asked a lot of questions to everyone all the time, me included. One day he said to me, Tim, I've learned over my lifetime that it's much better to ask questions than to make statements about things you do not have all the information about. I don't know about you, but I have been on the giving end and the receiving end of judgment statements to and from folks where I and they would have been much better served by asking questions, not making statements. Giving and receiving judgment can be a very dangerous thing. Asking questions can really help us serve wherever we're going and heal in the process. We have a lot to learn from Jesus on this. Faced with one who persecuted him and his followers unto death, and one who denied and abandoned him unto death, Jesus just asked questions. Why persecute? Why love? Let's take our lead for asking questions from him. He was always asking questions, questions about how people were, questions about how he could help them, questions about what they needed for healing, what his hands could offer them in healing, and questions about what they needed in a teaching presence that he could bring them. These and other turnaround tales all begin with questions. And the people in our lives who ask questions really help us most to turn around too. While this is true in our personal lives, it's also true in our communal life together and in our society. I've been thinking about that a lot this week as we've looked at bread. In nine days, bread will gather at the Celeste Center at the Ohio State Fairgrounds for the Nehemiah action. We will arrive there having followed a research process. There have been thousands of questions asked about our community over 27 years. Hundreds of questions have been asked this year about environmental injustice in our community. 
having tackled fair and affordable housing, jobs and job creation for the poor, health care, reconciliation and relationships in education and justice, reading in public schools, violence on the streets, transportation for people to work. Red has focused on environmental justice this year. How do you get a hold of environmental justice and make a change in the injustice that people face environmentally? Having asked hundreds of questions to leaders in our community, in part the answer is this. We will push for the protection of trees. We will push for the protection of trees on private land. Since 70% of our trees are on private land, and we all know that trees give us breath and life. Council member Liz Brown of Columbus City Council has agreed to come, and we believe she's ready to work on drafting an ordinance that Columbus have, having had three of the wettest years in the past five years, and large mature trees being taken down, are essential to combating excess storm weather. And when the trees come down in the neighborhoods of greatest need, where there are very few trees to begin with, the, the conditions get worse. You have to start somewhere. Asking questions has led us to this conclusion, and it's a creative solution. I invite you to be a part of a turnaround tale in Columbus. I invite every one of us to come together, your family, your friends, to join at the Celeste Center at the Ohio State Fairgrounds on May 10th to add our voices and physical presence in support of environmental protection. We are talking about no more than 120 minutes of your life to join with others for justice action. Can you join and will you join with 200 of your members and friends at First Church and several thousand other Jews and Christians and Muslims in our community from 6.45 to 8.30? It's a question. I hope that you can answer yes. As we come to God's table of grace and receive the bread of forgiveness and the cup of reconciliation, let each one of us ask ourselves, how do I want to be and who do I want to be as a follower of Jesus? Why ask? Well, perhaps because it will shape every other question that we ask about ourselves and how we live in the world with all people and all creation that God has given into our care. Amen.